but by the end of August our repertoire was vapid from countless reproductions, and it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley place fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings and explanations it drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house. Walking south, one faced its porch, the sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house was low, was once white with a deep front porch and green shutters, but had long ago darkened to the colour of the slate grey yard around it. Rain rotted shingles drooped over the eaves of the veranda, oak trees kept the sun away. The remains of a picket drunkenly guarded the front yard, a swept yard that was never swept, where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Jem and I had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down, and peeped in windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy small crimes committed in Maycomb were his work. Once the town was terrorised by a series of morbid nocturnal events, people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated, although the culprit was Crazy Eddie, who eventually drowned himself in Barker's Eddy, people still looked at the Radley place, unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A negro would not pass the Radley place at night, he would cut across to the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Maycomb school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot, from the Radley chicken yard tall pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard, but the nuts lay untouched. By the children, Radley pecans would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley. Yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. The misery of that house began many years before Jem and I were born. The Radleys, welcome anywhere in town, kept to themselves a predilection unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Mrs. Radley seldom, if ever, crossed the street for a mid morning coffee break with her neighbours, and certainly never joined a missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked to town at 11.30 every morning and came back promptly at 12, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighborhood assumed contained the family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living, Jem said he bought cotton, a polite term for doing nothing, but Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. The shutters and doors of the Radley house were closed on Sundays, another thing alien to make homes ways, closed doors meant illness and cold weather. Only. Of all days Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting, ladies wore. Corsets, men wore coats, children wore shoes. But to climb the Radley front steps and call, he why, of a Sunday afternoon was something their neighbours never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if it ever had any, Atticus said yes, but before I was born. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from Old Sarum, an enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the northern part of the county, and they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. They did little, but enough to be discussed by the town and publicly warned from three pulpits, they hung around the barbershop, they rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays and went to the picture show, they attended dances at the county's riverside gambling hell, the Jew drop in and fishing camp, they experimented with stumpful whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had nerve enough to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. One night, in an excessive spurt of high spirits, the boys backed around the square in a borrowed flivver, resisted arrest by Maycomb's ancient beetle, Mr. Connor, and locked him in the courthouse outhouse. The ten decided something had to be done, Mr. Connor said he knew who each and every one of them was, and he was bound and determined they wouldn't get away with it, 
so the boys came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence and hearing of a female. The judge asked Mr. Connor why he included the last charge, Mr. Connor said they cussed so loud he was sure every lady in Maycomb heard them. The judge decided to send the boys to the state industrial school, where boys were sometimes sent for no other reason than to provide them with food and decent shelter, it was no prison and it was no. Disgrace. Mr. Radley thought it was. If the judge released Arthur, Mr. Radley would see to it that Arthur gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. The other boys attended the industrial school and received the best secondary education to be had in the state, one of them eventually worked his way through engineering school at Auburn. The doors of the Radley house were closed on weekdays as well as Sundays, and Mr. Radley's boy was not seen again for fifteen years. But there came a day, barely within Jem's memory, when Boo Radley was heard from and was seen by several people, but not by Jem. He said Atticus never talked much about the Radleys, when Jem would question him Atticus's only answer was for him to mind his own business and let the Radleys mind theirs, they had a right to, but when it happened Jem said Atticus shook his head and said, millimeter, millimeter, millimeter. So Jem received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold, who said she knew the whole thing. According to Miss Stephanie, who was sitting in the living room cutting some items from the make home tribune to paste in his scrapbook. His father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, who drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled them out, wiped them on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran screaming into the street that Arthur was killing them all, but when the sheriff arrived he found Boo still sitting in the living room, cutting up the tribune. He was thirty-three years old then. Miss Stephanie said old Mr. Radley said no Radley was going to any asylum, when it was suggested that a season in Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo. Boo wasn't crazy, he was high-strung at times. It was all right to shut him up, Mr. Radley conceded, but insisted that Boo not be charged with anything, he was not a criminal. The sheriff had in the heart to put him in jail alongside Negroes, so Boo was locked in the courthouse basement. Boo's transition from the basement to back home was nebulous in Jem's memory. Miss Stephanie Crawford said some of the town council told Mr. Radley that if he didn't take Boo back, Boo would die of mold from the damp. Besides, Boo could not live forever on the bounty of the county. Nobody knew what form of intimidation Mr. Radley employed to keep Boo out of sight, but Jem figured that Mr. Radley kept him chained to the bed most of the time. Atticus said no, it wasn't that sort of thing, that there were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mrs. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, and pour water on her canners. But every day Jem and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin leathery man with colorless eyes, so colorless they did not reflect light. His cheekbones were sharp, and his mouth was wide, with a thin upper lip, and a full lower lip. Miss Stephanie Crawford said he was so upright he took the word of God as his only law, and we believed her, because Mr. Radley's posture was ramrod straight. He never spoke to us. When he passed we would look at the ground and say, Good morning, sir, and he would cough in reply. Mr. Radley's elder son lived. In Pesacola, he came home at Christmas, and he was one of the few persons we ever saw enter or leave the place. From the day Mr. Radley took Arthur home, people said the house died. But there came a day when Atticus told us he'd wear us out if we made any noise in the yard and commissioned Calpurnia to serve in his absence if she heard a sound out of us. Mr. Radley was dying. He took his time about it. Wooden sawhorses blocked the road at each end of the Radley lot, straw was put down on the sidewalk, traffic was diverted to the back street. 
Dr. Reynolds parked his car in front of our house and walked to the Radleys every time he called. Jem and I crept around the yard for days. At last the sawhorses were taken away, and we stood watching from the front porch when Mr. Radley made his final journey past our house. There goes the meanest man ever God blew breath into, murmured Calpurnia, and she spat meditatively into the yard. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia rarely commented on the ways of white people. The neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under Boo would come out, but it had another thing coming, Boo's elder brother returned from Pesacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was their ages. Jem said Mr. Nathan Radley bought cotton, too. Mr. Nathan would speak to us, however, when we said good morning, and sometimes we saw him coming from town with a magazine in his hand. The more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know, the longer he would stand hugging the light pole on the corner, the more he would wonder. Wonder what he does in there, he would murmur. Looks like he'd just stick his head out the door. Jem said he goes out, all right, when it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up in the middle of the night one time and saw him looking straight through the window at her, said his head was like a skull looking at her. Ain't you ever waked up at night and heard him, Dill? He walks like this, Jem slid his feet through the gravel. Why do you think Miss Rachel locks up so tight at night? I've seen his tracks in our backyard many a morning, and one night I heard him scratching on the back screen, but he was gone time Atticus got there. Wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jem gave a reasonable description of Boo, Boo was about six and a half feet tall, judging from his tracks, he dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch, that's why his hands were bloodstained, if you ate an animal roar, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long jagged scar that ran across his face, what teeth he had were yellow and rotten, his eyes popped, and he drooled most of the time. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jem said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jem the Grey Ghost against two Tom Swifts that Jem wouldn't get any farther than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jem had never declined a dare. Jem thought about it for three days. I suppose he loved honour more than his head, for Dill wore him down easily, you're scared, Dill said, the first day. Ain't scared, just respectful, Jem said. The next day Dill said, you're too scared even to put your big toe in the front yard. Jem said he reckoned he wasn't, he'd passed the Radley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him the third day, when he told Jem that folks in Meridian certainly weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb, that he'd never seen such scary folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jem march to the corner, where he stopped and leaned against the light pole, watching the gate hanging crazily on its homemade hinge. I hope you've got it through your head that he'll kill us each and every one, Dill Harris, said Jem, when we joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it, remember. You're still scared, murmured Dill patiently. Jem wanted Dill to know once and for all that he wasn't scared of anything, it's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Besides, Jem had his little sister to think of. When he said that, I knew he was afraid. Jem had his little sister to think of the time I dared him to jump off the top of the house, if I got killed, what would become of you, he asked. Then he jumped, landed unhurt, and his sense of responsibility left him until confronted by the Radley place. You gonna run out on a dare? asked Dill. If you are, then. Dill, you have to think about these things, Jem said. Let me think a minute, it's sort of like making a turtle come out. How's that? asked Dill. Strike a match under him. 
I told Jem if he set fire to the Rudley house I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. Ain't hateful, just persuades him, s not like you'd chunk him in the fire, Jem growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles can't feel, stupid, said Jem. Were you ever a turtle, ho? Huh? My stars, Dill. Now let me think, reckon we can rock him. Jem stood and thought so long that Dill made a mild concession, I won't say you ran out on a darren, I'll swap you the grey ghost if you just go up and touch the house. Jem brightened. Touch the house, that all. Dill nodded. Sure that's all, now. I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all, said Dill. He'll probably come out after you when he sees you in the yard, then scout and mill jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't gonna hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Well go on, said Dill, scout and miss right behind you. I'm going, said Jem, don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again, studying the simple terrain as if deciding how best to effect an entry, frowning and scratching his head. Then I sneered at him. Jem threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm and ran back past us, not waiting to see if his foray was successful. Dill and I followed on his heels. Safely on our porch, panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick, but as we stared down the street we thought we saw an inside shutter move. Flick. A tiny, almost invisible movement, and the house was still.